Okay, so we're going to be turning, as I said, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. But as you're turning there, I was, I was thinking back several years ago. I have a fellow pastor friend. Um, actually, I was his youth pastor previously. And he had, he had always, he was a former athlete. He was getting a little bit older. And he had one of those struggles that, you know, many men do. And they pass middle age and say, oh, I want to get back in shape. I need to eat healthier. I'm putting on a little bit of extra pounds. I'm not exercising. And he was to that point in life where he tried to start an exercise um, program. He starts to, trying to eat health, and he just couldn't do it long-term processes. And then, then something happened, because he and my dad would talk. They're, they were seminary buddies. And they would talk and say, hey, so how's your exercise going? It's not. And then one day, um, John got the diagnosis, said he had diabetes. And from that day on, his walking regimen was daily. His eating regimen was daily. And not only did he lose weight and get into better shape, but he was completely consistent. And I remember the conversation, because I was sitting there as the two of them were talking. He says, how is it that you're able to be so disciplined now after you struggled for so many years? He says, because now it's a matter of life and death. If I want to live long enough to see my grandchildren and to raise them, I have to, do, I have to make the proper changes. Before, it was a good idea, but now I realize the significance of my actions because of the diagnosis that I received. Sometimes in life we get those moments, don't we, where, where we are faced with the truth and then we have to respond. Now, we can do what a lot of people do and play ostrich and hide our head in the ground and pretend that there are no repercussions from our actions. But denying that there are repercussions, denying that there are consequences doesn't make the consequences go away. And we'll talk about this. Uh, but the Apostle Paul has talked to the church in Corinth, and they have been having a problem. They had been having some spiritual rebellion. They had been having some spiritual error, and he had to rebuke them. He had to confront them over the error that they were making. And when they receive the diagnosis, then they have to make a response. Now, this is the good part of the passage, because Paul is now going to speak with joy to the Corinthian church and saying, you have responded correctly. You have chosen life. You have chosen, chosen health. You have chosen obedience. And we are restored in relationship. He, he talks about how Titus came with the verdict. See, the Apostle Paul sent the letter, this painful letter, this harsh letter, this letter in tone, which was rebuking. And he waited to see what the response would be. And like anybody who's vested, whether it's your children, whether it's your friends, you, you can kind of feel the tension as he's recollecting here, saying, I think they're going to do the right thing. I hope they're going to do the right thing. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're going to do the right thing, but what if they don't do the right thing? And you can hear, obviously, this is really good for your prayer life. Now, we don't want to give in into anxiety, but we are certain that Paul is praying for these people, but he didn't want to just pray from Ephesus. So he journeyed all the way up into Macedonia, which finally, at this time, Titus has come back and he gives him the good report, and that good report was the basis for this entire letter we've been going through by the Apostle Paul. And now he is letting the Corinthians know about his response and how this came to be. So in chapter 7, verse 2, and I'm just going to read the whole thing so, so you don't get lost as I read this larger passage. I'd encourage you to follow along in, in your Bibles. Um, certainly you can read from any version that you have. I'm going to be reading out the New King James this morning. But we start off in, in chapter 2 and we read, Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, for I said before that you are in our hearts, to die together, to live together. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort, I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. 
For I perceive that the same epistle which made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this thing, with you sorrow, observe this thing, that you sorrow in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what what vindication. In all these things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore also I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Therefore we have been comforted in in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Now as we look at this passage again and we come back to it, we're going to go a little bit back and forth um, because Paul doesn't speak specifically in a linear, time-driven manner. He goes back and forth to comfort. It's kind of a chiasmus of thought. That's like an X. So the, the, ends, the ends parallel each other. The inner circle parallels each other. And in the middle, you have kind of the heart of what he is speaking about. And we'll talk about that. But he, he begins, and he's talking here about, I got a good report. I heard Titus came to see me. I was, I, was, I was worried about you. I was concerned about you. I was fearful about your response, even though I was boasting about you and confident you'd have the right response. But still, I had this, this anxiety, and I sent Titus. And Titus returned to me, and he gave a good report, and now I have joy. Like I said, the church had been in rebellion. The church had had problems. They had been not heeding the words of the apostle who founded the church, who loved them. And there had been this occasion of difficulty, this time of difficulty between the two. And finally he sends Titus, and Titus says they're responding, and he comes to Paul. Now Paul says, now I too am going to be able to come see you in person. Because remember, previously he said, I was determined in my heart I was not going to come face to face again if it was going to be negative. I love you. I don't want to come to berate you. I do not want to come to hurt you. I do not want to come to witness your disobedience. But instead, now we, I can come. I'm going to come visit. So he gives him a little bit of a heads up, which is probably a good thing for some of you. I know in this room... There are a couple different groups of people. There are those of you that if I said, hey, I need you to prepare your house for a guest, you would like want a six-month timetable, right? Others of you might be like six minutes. Six minutes, I'll just see. Do I have clean linens? And do we have, you know, a pillow and a place for them to sleep? And there, there there is some variance there. But Paul is not going to just show up on their doorstep and say, here I am. He's letting them know he's coming. So they have the time to prepare themselves emotionally, because it has been a roller coaster. Spiritually, um, just in case something's still out of order, he's given a little bit of time to clean up. It's kind of that warning you give to your children when you're going to your room. They say their room's clean. You say, I'm going to go check your room in two minutes. So you might want to give it one more final look over. I always like it when you do that, and two minutes pass. I'm like, not yet. I thought you said it was clean. But he's giving them that opportunity, saying, I'm going to come see you. But Paul, Paul says, I want you to know what's been going on in our own lives. Don't think that we were very cavalier, that we, there was no thought put in, into the correction that we were giving you. Don't think that we were gloating, that we thought better of ourselves while you were going through this difficult time. No, rather, I want you to see my heart, that my heart ached for you. My heart was breaking over the estrangement that we had between each other. And he says in verse 5, for even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. 
But we are afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. You see, he says, look, not only were we willing to make this long journey because we loved you, but our hearts ached for you and longed for this moment which now finally has arrived. And when Titus came, they were comforted. So he's writing now, this is a great joyous occasion for him. It's been physically hard. It's been spiritually hard. It's been a hard process for all of them to go together. But now he's saying, we will live together. We have joy together. We are reconciled. But we are reconciled because we are traveling the same direction. A lot of times we want to be reconciled in life by combining things that we can't combine. That was kind of a big part of the sermon last week when Pastor Chris got up to say that. I'm going to say, hey, we want to be reconciled. We want to receive each other with joy. We want to have this perfect union. And then we want to head completely different directions. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work practically and physically. And even if you have a good relationship, you're civil towards one another, you're polite towards one another, and you do genuinely care about one another, you can't have that perfect reconciliation when you're running different directions. But Paul now says, now we are in step with one another again. We can walk together. We can rejoice with one another. We can have the communion that we should have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's excited. He's excited to hear how well the church is doing. I mean, isn't it a great joy, parents and some of you, grandparents, when you get a report card, and you open it up, and it's a good report. A few of you are like, I've never had that happen. <laughs> but when you have that occasion, maybe then, then go to the citizenship. At least, you know, such and such. Johnny is a delight and a pleasure to have in class. You know, like, hang your hat on that. But when you get the good reports, and somebody comes to you and says, your child is a blessing, your child is a joy, your child has done well. As a parent, as somebody who cares for the person who's receiving this commendation, your heart swells a little bit. You're happy. Not in a sinful pride, but you are so glad and excited to see them do well, to do what they should. This is, this is a spiritual, a spiritually correct motivation, spiritually correct attitude. In fact, in 3 John um, chapter 1, verse 4, we read, I have no greater joy This is Apostle John writing to his churches and his spiritual children. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And really, you could summarize everything that Paul says at the beginning of this passage. I have no greater joy than to hear that you, Corinthian church, have responded in obedience and are now walking in the truth. And then Paul says, Therefore, verse 13, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus. Your obedience, it it keeps going. It brought me joy. It brought Titus joy. And hopefully it is bringing you joy. On the other hand, uh, do you ever have one of those moments in your life? Paul is saying, well, the lead up to this, where you don't know how it's going to go. It's the moment of truth type type moment. Maybe it's in a doctor's waiting room when you've had some testing done and the doctor's coming in and say, here are the results of the test. It could be a minor procedure. It could be a major life-changing procedure, but there is that, that pause where you don't know which way it's going to go and saying, my life could 100% change in the next minute. And you kind of get that with Paul here. What is going to happen? Waiting for Titus to come to him. Um, Francis Scott Key, who wrote The Star-Spangled Banner, many of you know the backstory on that. He was on, on a British ship as an, as an American. They were doing a prisoner exchange. And so they, they required him to stay during the battle because they didn't want him to give the reports of what they were going to be doing by their maneuvers in, in the battle in the War of 1812. And there was the bombardment on the fort in the middle of the night. And then 
because there was darkness and the lights went out. He did not know who had won the battle. So early in the morning, how he could finally see who had won, having no report from the British soldiers on the ship, was to go out and to look at the fort and to see that with the morning they raised the American flag and the fort was still standing. During the night, he had no comfort. He was anxious. He was wondering, is the battle won or is the battle lost? What has happened to my people? And so Paul has been in Macedonia waiting, what is happening with my Corinthian church? And then Titus comes. And in a sense, the flag is raised and he sees there has been a great and profound spiritual victory at this church. And he rejoices and he writes this letter very much as Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, the words to it, which became our national anthem out of the joy of that moment. Paul has reason to celebrate. But he also lets him know that this time where I was not there with you, this time, this opportunity for you to respond correctly was necessary. You needed the chance to respond correctly. Because certainly there was a problem here. You were living incorrectly. You were being disobedient to God. You were being rebellious towards your spiritual authorities and you were being incorrect in terms of some of your beliefs. So you needed the opportunity to change course. And we see, as we read through this, um, in verse 12, there is probably a primary instigator of what was going wrong. And Paul needed to step back after the letter and let the church deal with their own issues. And he says, even if I made you grieve, I do not regret it, in verse 8. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. See, this was a moment of truth, and Paul was confident they would do the right thing, but anxious just in case they wouldn't. You know, we have those moments, right? When, you're, when you see your children going up to that moment of truth, it may not be a big deal in terms of spiritual repercussions, in terms of life course repercussions, but those times where you're just anxious as a parent. Maybe your kid is coming up to bat and the game is on the line and you're just thinking, please don't strike out. Please don't strike out. Walk. Just walk. Get hit by a pitch. I don't care. Let, let the kid behind you in line make the final out of the game. I know when Lori and I have watched our boys play baseball, even though we are confident in their ability at that moment when the game is on the line and you see that last grounder is hit to them. As a parent, sometimes you're like, please don't bobble it. Please don't bobble it. Make a, good, make a good fielding try. Make a good throw. They did it. We knew they could do it, but now we rejoice because they did. Uh, just this last week, actually, Garrett was uh, in his geography bee. I told him I was going to use him as an illustration this morning. He's got, for those of you who feel bad for Garrett, don't feel bad for Garrett. He's, he's, he's got way too much confidence that this stuff just rolls off his back. And plus, this is kind of a good story. Because he was in his school geography B. And they do that every year at, at his elementary school. And so all the fourth graders and fifth graders and sixth graders, they have a class competition. And the top two go to the school competition. And the parents are invited out where we can watch them there. And I'm sitting beside Lori, who every time the microphone is passed to him, it's his turn. She's like, oh, I can't look. I mean, she's having an ulcer over a geography bee, right? Just going, please answer the right, answer the question the right way. And then when you see his success, which we know he can do, we know he loves geography, which proves his relation to me. It's just the sickness apparently passed down. But we know he loves this. We know he's good at it. We know he's capable. But you're like, what if they ask him something really random? What if he just has a brain cramp? What if you have that anxiety? You know, you know how that feels for another person to not be able to do anything about what is about to happen? And let me just interject here. This is a good time to pray. This is a great time to pray. Uh, the Bible tells us not to be anxious. The only good thing about anxiety that I found in my own life is it should drive me to prayer, which not only heals the anxious spirit, but is where I should have started in the first place. And we feel that Paul was praying and concerned. So sometimes we do. We have to, we have to stand on the sideline and we have to let people have have the opportunity to fail or succeed on their own. 
This is hard as parents, parents specifically in this context, but I think many of you have other contexts which you can relate. To let somebody have the opportunity to succeed or to fail. Sometimes we don't give any, any people the opportunity to fail, ever. We want to do all the work for them. We want to limit the opportunities they have, but we also, in doing so, rob them of the opportunities to succeed and to grow and to develop spiritually as the next leaders, as the next group of teachers and servants. And, and it's hard it's hard to stand back and to trust God to deal with the people we love. But we know that these spiritual chances, as we give people a chance to succeed, create growth. They do. They create growth. Um, the, goal, the goal for the test, the goal for the opportunity is godliness. We need, but we need opportunities to show what God has already been doing in our life. The Corinthians had this opportunity. Paul stepped back and says, God is doing something. I'm going to trust that he will bring this to completion. We need opportunities to proclaim God and his work, do we not? Hopefully, each of you has an opportunity in your life that you don't just come to church and live vicariously through a select few and say, they have the opportunities to serve. We have the opportunities to watch. But all of us should take opportunities and hopefully be afforded opportunities where we are actively serving God and where other people can stand back and say, look what God is doing in you. And we need to allow those others to take those opportunities, even when their opportunities may be giving us opportunities to manage our own anxieties and our own nerves and fears. But Paul has stepped back and said, this was a chance for you to step out and show what God has been doing. But it had to start with this necessary correction because a lot of our opportunities in life are not just, hey, here's an opportunity to succeed. It's an opportunity for course correction. We all know that when we came to Jesus Christ, it was with the knowledge that you are a sinner separated from God by your own actions, your own rebellion. Now, there was good news there that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. He has made perfect atonement through his death on the cross, and powerfully rose from the dead, that we too can have a new life in him. But the good news came after we received the bad news, which was we needed saving. Why is it so exciting that there's a Savior? Because we need salvation. And so Paul likewise had spoken that there was spiritual error and rebellion, and we needed to respond. He had to correct them. Sometimes we don't like correction. Actually, how about we say that? We very rarely like correction. Very few people I've met like to be rebuked, like to be corrected, like to be told that they're wrong. And yet the Bible says it is appropriate when we are doing the wrong thing that others and that God would inform us of our error. Now, there's a whole other sermon on the method for that, that it should be done in love, that it should be done in truth, that it should be done in humility, and there's, there's a lot, lot more into that passage. But even God himself corrects us and disciplines us when we are in error. If we would jump ahead to the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, we read that in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son, it says in verse 5, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. And in verse 10, God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in his holiness. Paul has rebuked the church. In a sense, this was words of discipline. But he did it for their own good. And now as he has just said, I am joyful because you responded correctly. Look at the joy that you have brought to me. Look at the joy that you have brought to Titus. Look at the reputation that you are now having amongst the churches. That you have, you have behaved correctly. You should also have joy in this. Because you are becoming holy. And we see the, the pivotal verse of today's passage up here on the screen that for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. This is the center of the thought here. It, the rebuke should lead to life and to healing. 
Now we know when we go to a doctor, his hands, in order to heal us, may bring us pain. The doctor is not there to do harm, but sometimes it hurts, whether it is the setting of a bone or the removing of a splinter. But the intent, the motivation, is to bring healing and soundness to the person who is being treated. In the same way, Paul is there to bring correction, to bring healing, to bring obedience. And so we we do need to understand there was a need for the rebuke, it was necessary, and the motivation there was one of a pure heart on Paul's behalf. But let's stop here and ask, when we receive a rebuke, we have to look at our own our own inner life, our own hearts. Because our natural bent for most of us is if when we're rebuked is, who gives you the right to tell me that? You know, we kind of, walls go up, anger goes up, and we're ready for a fight instead of to stop, pray, think. Are they speaking truth? Are they speaking life? Are they for me? Is this of God? How, what is our response? Proverbs 15.5 says, A fool rejects his father's discipline. But whoever heeds reproof shows good sense. Everything else being equal, and I know it's not always equal, if you have a father that is truly for you, as we know our heavenly father is, as we know Paul, in this instance, as a spiritual father was, then we know his rebuke is aimed at us in order to help us. Will we then respond in a reasonable fashion, and say, he wants to help me be a better person, get ahead in life, be spiritually more obedient. So should I partner with that, or should I defy him just because? We need to respond correctly to a reproof, to a rebuke, to correction. This is not popular probably any time in human history. It's especially not popular now. We have this prevailing school of thought, which is very prevalent in our society, that you can't correct me. You can't make me feel bad. You can't make me feel ashamed. You can't tell me that I am wrong. That that would hurt my self-esteem. And as I've always gone back to a Christian comedian, says, self-esteem based on nothing? What is that? He says, okay, self-esteem comes from psychology. Psychology comes from Freud. Freud was an atheist. You could go that way. Or you could say, when the maker of all matter tells you that you matter, then you have a reason to feel worthwhile and valid in and of yourself. And when we live rightly with our maker, we have the blessings and the privileges that come with obedience. And we can be, have self-esteem esteeming what we have done because it lines up with that which is correct, not just by emotions which come and which go. Well, I I said something nice about Garrett. He's he's not he's not an angel. I mean if he is, he's a fallen one. We've looked for we've looked for wings. Yeah, he's hanging his head. He's not even he's not even sad. He's eating this up. But one time I remember a few years ago, he's on his top bunk of his bed and he had done something in order to raise the ire of his parents. He had misbehaved. And so we had sent him to his bed, and the time was come for the father to walk in the room and to tell him exactly what he has done wrong, and then to issue the punishment, whatsoever that may have been at the time. I don't even, I don't even recollect. But I remember on this, on this occasion, I am letting him know exactly why what he has done was so wrong. And he buries his head in his pillow, and he looks up for a moment and goes, Dad, you're making me feel bad. And I said, good! You should feel bad for what you just did. But what hurts my heart is you feel bad because I am hurting your feelings and not because of what you have done. The repentance that you should have should not be because my dad is being so mean to me, right? It should be because I really messed up. I'm a better person than that. Or as God works in me, I should be better than that. That is the sorrow that we should have, not so-and-so told me that I felt bad. Remember David? He got quite the rebuke. We're talking adultery and murder. And when his friend came with such a skillful correction, 
the prophet Nathan, the king who could have had this man killed, swept it away, said, I have sinned. And God preserved his broken kingdom. Oh, there, there were still consequences. Also another sermon. But God preserved him and showed him mercy out of the contriteness of his heart and his willingness to correct course. We don't want to let people continue to go the wrong way. A lot of times adults say that too. You're making me sad. Well, that's not the intent, but may your sorrow lead you to correction. May your sorrow lead you to life. May it not be like Cain, who when God rebuked him, when his offering was rejected and he had the opportunity to respond correctly, allowed that, that moment of truth, that moment of judgment, that moment of correction to lead to bitterness and further evil and sin. Instead of changing his course, saying, God says, you're going the wrong way, Cain. And instead of saying, oh, yeah, I should turn direction, he just started running as fast as he could in the direction he was already headed, to death, to judgment, to sins which multiplied and affected the earth adversely. Godly sorrow brings repentance, which leads to salvation. Worldly sorrow, the outcome is just death because there's no correction. So Paul said, I, I regretted the rebuke because I didn't want to hurt you. But I don't regret it because look at the goodness that has come out of it. You are whole. We are reconciled. God is glorified. Well, we do have to, we do have to stop and we have to think about our own, our own personal application. Each and every one of us have areas of our life that still need modification. They still need course correction. We are a work in progress. You know, we don't gather together here at Sunrise Church because we are the best Christians in the valley. We don't gather here because we're the best people in the valley. We're just people who God has poured his mercy out and with the working power of his Holy Spirit has make it, made us and is making us into something better than we ever imagined or dared to hope for ourselves because God is mighty and powerful and victorious. But when we try to do it our own way, we miss out on all of that blessing. We miss out on all that life change. We miss out on all that we could be. And from time to time, we need to, we need to be look in the mirror. We need to be told that what you are doing here is not beneficial. What you are doing here does not bring glory to God. What you are doing here is not wise. What you are doing here may even be sinful. And when we receive those reports, whether it's from a sermon like this where it's more generically or when it's a friend who loves you and comes to you and says, I love you and I hope you don't hate me, but I love you enough to tell you that you are messing up. We have to purpose in our own minds ahead of time, before the emotion of the moment, how do I want to respond to correction? I don't like to be corrected. I don't. But you know what I really hate is to be wrong. And I don't want to be wrong when it comes to the things of God. And I, I hope that I can prepare my heart prayerfully by reading his word, by trying to become the man that I know I should be, that I will be one who receives correction that will lead to life. We see, we see this all, all through scripture, that all of us need it. It's not just the Corinthians. It's not just a person in front of you or behind you in the row this morning. It's all of us from time to time will open up God's word. It may just be opening up his word and reading something and saying, ooh, we could do. I don't like this page, so I will stop reading it. All right, that's, that's just not very beneficial because we miss out on the life. It's kind of like if you woke up this morning and you looked in the mirror and said, I do not like the face looking back at me in the mirror. Now, you could go, and you could get a poster and put it there, so when you looked in your mirror every morning, you said, looking pretty good. You know, you could go and get a funhouse mirror and say, the scale told me I need to lose a few pounds. So we have banished the scale to the trash container and put in a funhouse mirror, and I look a lot thinner. Now, that doesn't change the reality, right? Some of us want to live in a world without scales and mirrors because we don't like reality, so we want to continue in our own self-deception. And say, everything's okay. 
But that can be a real problem just in, world, in the world events too, not even spiritually. Uh, Lori became acquainted with somebody just somehow through the blogging world that the father in the house died of a very, of a medical condition which should have been treated very, very easily. But he ignored the symptoms. He didn't want to go to the doctor. He did not want the bad report until the condition that he had was so pronounced that he was beyond saving. And, and as she was saying, uh, the, the person that she was reading about, I wish they would have gone in when it could have been corrected, when there was still a chance at life, instead of avoidance, which brought death way before its time. We, we need to be like that Corinthian church um, and respond to the correction. There's pain in correction. I'm not, I'm not going to minimize that. There's pain. There's growing pains. Just as when some of you, when you were growing up as, as a child, you know, into adolescence, into adulthood, there were growing pains and things hurt. There is pain in growth. We know that. You can't stay where you're at and not have some discomfort, not face the sin in your life and not feel some ickiness, not look at God's word and not feel at times a real sorrow out of the way you are living. But there is also life out of it. There is maturity. There is greater usefulness for the kingdom. And there is our Savior's pleasure. And like I come back to just that joy of knowing, of hoping that God would be pleased when I see him face to face. And we could hear those words, well done. So I hope that knowing the end and the hope that we have in Christ will give us a joy even in the process. And a joy in the motivation that God gives for us that is in his love and his desire to bring us to completeness and knowing that we uh, can bring our Savior joy. My own youth pastor was, was really good at telling me what I needed to hear. As a high schooler, I didn't often want to hear that. He wouldn't raise his voice. He wouldn't berate me. But more than once, his words were succinct and, and short and the appropriate time, and they were like a physician's tool, and they would just penetrate, and just go like, oh. And I'd have a choice of how to respond. I, I hope that you and I do not avoid the rebuke out of fear of the short-term pain, but rather we go to God and do say, as Scripture says, have your way with me. Because I know that I can trust my life in my Savior's hands to make me into something more, to make me into something beneficial, to make me into something beautiful. And in the chance of the Corinthians, essentially, spiritually, to shift from death to life. We all have sin. What we will do without realization is the difference between our eternity. But what we will do without realization even when we are in our Savior's hands, has a profound impact on our entire life.